a very, very warm welcome to our guests who have come from France, Natalia Zulai and Fabien Chartier. A very warm welcome to you, to each and every one of you in the audience. Thank you for your presence here. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to be in conversation with such prolific writers today. Thank you, PILF. Um, literature. France is a country with a great literary tradition and iconic literary movements. You have the classics, the golden age of French literature in the 17th century. You have the romantics, realists, impressionists, and so many more. Why is literature so important? It does matter deeply to the French. In fact, I think it plays a very important role in their sense of identity and it's also an object of pride for them, right? In fact, French is uh, literature is given so much importance and focus in schools. Children and students are encouraged to read <coughs> and to express themselves freely and fearlessly. You talk of French literature and what one comes to one's mind is Corneille, Racine, Molière, Hugo, Voltaire, perhaps Saint-Exupéry. But what is really contemporary French literature and what is the literary scene in France today? How does one define contemporary literature? Is it uh, an agent of change? Is it, is it conscious of the glorious tradition that it inherits? Or is it really a change or a new form of that glorious tradition? Is it provocative? Is it uh, controversial? Is it feminist? It is exactly all the questions that we are going to talk about today with our writers and authors. Which brings me on to a last question. Does literature really matter today? and do people read? I think with that, we will start a session. I, I will be asking the authors to present their journeys. And we will start with the main theme of conversation and end with a question and answer session at the end. Let me open the session with an author who has 25 years of experience in teaching French and English. He's currently a professor at the Université de Rennes in Brittany, which is uh, in Brittany, um, in which is northwest of France. He's a PhD scholar with a speciality in India and modern history. He's a polyglot. He speaks fluently English, French, and Spanish. And he says he used to speak a lot of Breton, Hindi, and Bengali. <laughs> so his Yes, and he is also a student of Delhi University and he taught French there for a year. So the contact with India has always been there and you will see why a little later. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, into that heaven of freedom, let my country awake. I'm sure these words resonate with most of you in the audience. Of course, these are words by none other than the great poet, essayist, novelist, philosopher, musician, painter, the first non-Western Indian Nobel Prize winner in 1913, our very own Guru Rabindranath Tagore. But why did I quote these lines? Because Gallimard, a very prestigious publishing house, and he was an editor in Gallimard as well. Gallimard has, yes, has come out in the quarto collection with a 1,600 page book on Gurudev Tagore. And what is more remarkable and impressive is that the two Tagore specialists, one of them is none other than Monsieur Fabien Chartier. <laughs> so Fabien, my first question to you is, why Tagore? Isn't it anachronistic to talk about a person and his works a century ago and to present them in front of today's modern society? 
what inspired you and my second question you have annotated and presented it what exactly is annotation and why did you use this form of writing thank you so much uh, jaya for this introduction but uh, humbly I, i'm not you know i, I cannot uh, receive this as uh, you know it's 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 too much an honor first to be here and to be presented does it work yes yeah. yes uh um so yeah i'm i'm far less than this uh, okay that was uh, a kind of eulogy and uh, thank you very much uh, i've i've done my best to present that great author uh, who is uh, robin jonath tagore and um the main thing is okay i'm going straight to the first question thank you also for the the organization of the pilf uh, festival that's that's a great organization we know all know how difficult it is and uh, i would like to thanks to thank also the french alliance uh, without which it would have been impossible for us to be here so and uh, you know the french alliance is here in pune all right it's a good way to learn french um having said this so now it's better maybe i'm speaking more uh, okay so i used to be a student at delhi university uh, that was 25 years ago and i was uh, at that time i wanted to study authors which were contemporary writers uh, authors uh, writing in english because i was studying english at that time and english literature so i wanted to study authors such as saman rushdi because he was really trendy at the time for good reasons i think uh, midnight children for example uh, um, i'm thinking about arundhati roy who was just a budding author at the time or amitav ghosh several authors um and um it was very difficult for me to do this because at delhi university uh they had this uh, idea of keeping uh the the english department in a more traditional way so you would study the 19th or 18th century author and shakespeare of course so i felt a bit disappointed and um and that was when um uh, i just saw a book in a book uh, in a bookshop in a uh, near delhi university and i saw a wonderful book or at least the front cover was really beautiful with a nice picture on it a black and white picture a photograph of you guess who so i i fell uh, literally in love with the photograph i think and then i opened the book and that was the gitanjali i believe and i read the poem and i felt okay i'll change the subject and go directly to this author uh and i've not changed my mind i never regret this of course uh for many many reasons uh because uh we might think that okay tagore is okay is uh, like uh 150 years uh, old in a certain uh, way of thinking but um you know he's very contemporary there is no doubt about this and he's also uh very universal so when we are dealing with great authors great classics and uh, you mentioned a few from uh, french origins we're dealing with authors who are beyond their borders so this is of course tagore is a bengali author and the greatest of the, of the whole uh, in bengali literature but you know there are many others um but you yeah it's like the great french authors as well they don't know borders uh, and language cannot be automatically a frontier also because of the work of translators so this will go back maybe in a moment so i uh, i've never been disappointed with that first choice of going through rabindranath tagore and because i've discovered his novels his short stories his essays and uh i'm today i'm very happy to have done this job which was to edit and as you said anointing the uh the the this this book that is a, a miscellany maybe uh, of uh, of some of a selection of uh, his most famous novels poems and short stories and essays and i have also tried to contextualize as much as possible all this work so that the french readers who do not know that much about tagore can have access to not only the works but also the environment in which tagore was writing so this was the the purpose and i think by 
answering this way, I've, I've tried to uh, talk about this an annotation thing. Uh, it's more like a contextualization right. that, uh, than annotation for just, and I'll stop with this. It's just because uh, I don't want to interpret Tagore. For one specific reason is that Tagore is in favor of freedom of speech yes. and the freedom of spirit, okay, the independence of spirit. So you, the reader has to make his own choice or her own choices when reading uh, his poetry, for example. So that was not my role to interpret, but to give access. Okay. How did the French society uh, accept it? You mean the book? Or yes, the, the book, of course. Okay, uh, the book was released in 2020, in February 2020, and one week after, that was the beginning of the pandemic. So, <laughs> Oh. It was a really difficult time for the publishing house. In fact, everything was prepared for a Paris uh, Salon du Livre, which is the book fair in Paris, very famous one. So, of course, it, w it has not become a bestseller, <laughs> to be honest, but it's not the idea. This book is here for a long time. It will be used as a reference. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, uh, it's more like in the long term that we are going to see whether or not it was worth it, but I'm, I know already that it's worth it because I'm here. <laughs> uh, just to say that uh, in France, Tagore is okay. He had uh, uh, a great, great uh, time in the 1920s, 1930s. Then it went a bit. It, it was a bit more complicated. But I can't see any reason why, because of the contents of his works, mm -hmm. why he should not reappear today. And there should be a renaissance. Right. <coughs> Thank you. It gives me great pleasure <coughs> to introduce our most celebrated author. She has been a student of the prestigious Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and has been a teacher and an editor before she became an author. And uh, she, to her credit, she has 10 novels and one of her novel, which is very celebrated, which is called Titus Neme Pas Bernice. Um, yes, Fabien. Merci. <laughs> yes. So this famous book got her the f prestigious Prix Medicis in 2015. Round of applause for <laughs> Nathalie Azulay. Uh, and her latest novel called La Fille Parfaite, The Perfect Daughter, has also been nominated for several awards. And this year, she got the Evoque Literary Prize and the Prix Le Penche for this latest novel, La Fille Parfaite. Um, Nathalie is passionate about cinema and one can see the influence in her writings. Um, she is also on the panel of judges for the Prix Femina, which is again a very famous literary award in France. A teacher at heart, she conducts creative writing workshops for students at Sciences Po and currently she's conducting workshops for who? Journalists and advocates who want to go into the world of fiction. So that is her passion as well and she's also translated Mrs. Dalloway from uh, the author from Virginia Woolf and she's a very good translator and all her novels have been translated. Natalie, I'd like to ask you, the protagonists in your latest novel are two girls it talks of their journey, their lives together, their relationships, and their emotions, their upheavals. But it also highlights a very important issue of gender bias, inequality, and inclusiveness. It also treats a question which is very, very, uh, let's say, important in our society. I don't know if it is in France. And that is, why do boys always take science as a career option? And why are girls always discouraged for that and take up literature and social science? This is very, very, this mindset is very common in India. In fact, yesterday, those who were there for Sudha Murthy's lecture, she mentioned that in 1968, she was the only girl who took up engineering despite a lot of um, dissent from her family member. They said she wouldn't get married, she wouldn't find a suitor, she would leave, she will not be able to cope up with engineering, what is she doing? 
but she stood her ground and she became an engineer so my question to you natalie is is this issue very close to your heart or is this a very uh, contextual issue in france today thank you jaya thank you uh, to all of you for being here thank you to the alliance française to the institut français and to the pilf organization which is great actually um yeah this issue is very close to my heart and i didn't know that uh, it was so uh, relevant for india too because i thought india was you know early earlier than france in this uh, evolution and in this gender gap career uh, issue but um basically in france it's a very uh, big issue because uh, as you said as an as in, in your introduction uh, France is a very, very literary uh, country because of the history, because of the tradition, because we are the, the country of conversation, yes. of the salon, I don't know how you yes. translate this. And uh, it's been a, a long story and uh, it's a very tenacious uh, uh, trend. So uh, the scientists in France are very important, They're, they are very uh, good scientists, but uh, the ones who are always heard and listened to mm -hmm. are the intellectual literary uh, people. Mm -hmm. So that uh, literature and social sciences and philosophy are very powerful, are still very powerful um, in the media field and uh, in, the, in the salon, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the press and uh, most of the journalists are people who uh, went through uh, literary uh, studies. Mm -hmm. So that science, um, whereas it is so powerful, I mean, indeed, uh, it's, it's not very well listened to. So I think there is a kind of injustice there. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, as for the gender bias thing, uh, girls, when they started to study in France, they were pushed to these kind of uh, careers, mm -hmm. educational uh, careers such as literature, arts, history of art, and um, social sciences uh, after a while. But as for science and mathematics, there were very few. And there still are very few, although you have active action to uh, welcome them and to encourage them, and, but it still doesn't work very well. I don't know why, there are many, many uh, explanations for that, but um, to me, there is a historical issue because science gives you the key to understand the, yes. the, the, well, the, word, the word evolution, mm -hmm. and it gives you the key for industry and technology, and for, uh, for uh, many decades, I guess that men wanted to keep the key yeah, and yes. wanted to uh, to hold back the power from the girls. But now I think it's has, it has changed a little bit. Uh, but it's going to be a very slow evolution. And um, when girls study well started to study, I guess that they didn't have in mind that if they had to support families, that they had to be independent. Uh, that that could remain single women, so that working and studying uh, could be could still be considered as leisure and uh, as uh, hobbies. So that they went to literature and to art because that were the things they liked to do right. at home. Yes, and uh, this is very tenacious, and it's it's a very long-lasting trend. So that today things are changing, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, and uh, we have a lot of, of, of uh, uh, female engineers, female scientists, but there is still one field who is very masculine, and, uh, and this is mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that uh, India, uh, the math tradition is very strong, is very renowned, uh, so you know about this. And uh, in France, we have a very uh, good uh, education program in mathematics, which is, quietly, well, which is quite worldwide renowned. But uh, 
um, as a matter of fact, there are very few girls mm -hmm. still. So um, my novel <coughs> wanted to deal with this okay. issue and wanted to question why the girls wouldn't take mathematics and mm -hmm. wouldn't go for it. Okay. So that one of my characters, one of and the lead character, uh, happens to be a girl, a daughter, the daughter of a father who was an engineer and who wanted to be a researcher, but he mm -hmm. couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So that his own ambition uh, was uh, transferred to his daughter, and she did it. So she became a very famous mathematician. And uh, the whole book tells the story of this girl uh, who challenges uh, a man's world mm -hmm. and who's still a girl, who's still a woman and who's going to be a mother. Uh, but um, she will challenge and she will make it uh, without giving up um, on anything. You know, she won't have to give in or to give up. And uh, so... Um, this was the whole story. And the friendship between the two characters, uh, one is called Rachel, and she's the literary girl, and the other one, the mathematician, is called Adele. And the whole friendship is about uh, a common passion for knowledge, mm -hmm. a common ambition to become, you know, great girls, mm -hmm. uh, um, and a common rivalry between these two, two. fields of knowledge. Right. right. And this novel you have presented in a very original style. That is, it is a detective novel in the form of an investigation. Why did you choose this style? I wanted to write um, uh, li uh, the story uh, like a mystery, mm -hmm. story, a, a crime fiction story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the beginning, and I won't spoil anything, but at the very beginning yes. of the story, uh, page one, uh, one of them um, uh, commits suicide. So mm. from the start, there is a corpse, there is uh, cops, there are cops, and uh, there is a big question and a big mystery. Mm -hmm. Why did she do that? Why would she would she do would she do that? Because she was so bright, she was so successful, she didn't have any kind of you know uh, serious problems. So. Mm -hmm. People are very puzzled with her death, and um, especially Rachel, who didn't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who didn't have a clue about uh, what, what uh, Adel could go through. So um, I wanted to give to my novel a very um, uh, swift uh, tempo, mm -hmm. swift mm -hmm. rhythm, just like in a mystery uh, okay. um, fiction. And uh, at the same time, I wanted to intertwine it with the coming of age style. Mm -hmm. yeah. So because the whole story is going back to the past, uh, telling about the way they go through education, through learning, and through ambition. So I, 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 would, um, I wanted to intertwine these two uh, uh, threads. Thank you. <coughs> So since uh, both of you are in the field of translation as well, um, I would like to know, is that a new type of genre? Or is it something to do with contemporary literature? In the sense, I've heard of these words called transfiction, exofiction, uh, related to translation. For example, when you translated Tagore, did you think, did you keep it in mind, the relation and the bond between the creator, the interpreter, translator, and the reader. Okay, so first of all, <coughs> sorry, uh, I'm not a translator from Bangla uh, to um, to French, which is uh, some something I can't do because my level of Bengali is too low, far too low. <laughs> so what I translated were uh, was generally. Uh, exactly the same as those translators did in the past that's taking the English version of the text and translate them into French we have a very few translators translating from Bengali to French directly so that can be a lost in translation probably but we'll see that for the moment it's the only thing we've got uh, so as a translator I have to consider that uh, 
there's, or very often, because what I translated usually was his essays or lectures which he gave uh, in Europe, uh, so directly from English. He was mm -hmm. writing these uh, speeches directly in English. So I think this I can do. So very respectfully, I think translation uh, from Bengali to English, then to French, is an option which I might reconsider in the future, but right now, no, <laughs> it's impossible. Uh, but still, translation for me, and I think, I c because I've been dealing with all these translations, so I can talk about all the other translations a little bit, to me they are recreations. Mm. And I like this term because you've got recreation, like a creation again, and then there is this aspect of recreation in the sense it's recreational. And what me I mean by this is like, you, to me, somebody who is translating needs to have pleasure in it. Mm. He needs heart yes. because it's an artistic job. He needs to take pleasure in it, otherwise he's going to struggle very hard. And then there is this transformation, of course, but to be he is, is a go-between. And when we're dealing with Tagore, we all know that's what he has been doing all his life, being a, a go-between, between his lord, okay, or mm. whoever he called his lord, or the Jivan Devata, and mm. the common people. So we've got already this go-between there. But as a translator, it's exactly the same process. It's like you have to erase yourself or to be as discreet as possible and yet it's impossible not to give your personal emotion through them. The difficulty with Tagore comes from the fact that you've got different layers of interpretation. Yes. So this a translation and I was asked, I was in Jaipur the, two days ago, three days ago and I was asked a very good question from the audience. I hope you uh, will have a interaction at the end, by the way. And I was asked by a young lady if you had happened to see Tagore in person, what would you ask him? Mm. That was a difficult question. <laughs> very nice question. <laughs> First thing, I would have, would have been very happy. <laughs> I would have probably uh, touched his feet and all this. But I would have also asked him, among all the layers of interpretations that which are possible, which one would you select so that as a translator I can pick up the one, two or three threads which are the most important so that I can convey this message? Because there are so many that for a translator, I'm sorry, but it's impossible to give them all. So that's, that's the thing. Yes, thank you. Um, so Natalie, coming to translation, and I talked about exofiction. Do you think today's contemporary literature talks of current topics like, say, race and caste conflicts, or gender ident gender bias, or identity crises? Is exofiction that taking from reality and then fictionalizing it? Uh, well, uh, exofiction is a very specific word. Um, Meaning that uh, you take uh, a person, a real person belonging to the past and famous for, I don't know, uh, uh, if it can be a political figure, it can be a, political, um, a literary figure, it can be uh, uh, a, scientific, a scientist or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but it's fam he's famous or she's famous. And you uh, just uh, made he uh, or, uh, well, you made her or him a character, a fictional character, and you tell an, a story about him or about her, but in another way, in a more personal way, intimate way. Okay. This is very, um, uh, the, the very uh, specific job of exofiction. This is what I did in mm -hmm. this book with okay. Jean Racine, who happens to be a 17th century French playwright and uh, who's famous for his plays and is mm -hmm. kind of a very uh, iconic uh, in classic uh, culture. But uh, I turned him into a very intimate character 
And I went through his childhood, his learning, his education, his ambition, and his own, you know, goals, personal goals. Uh, and I went uh, through his inner thoughts and mm -hmm. uh, inner, very inner di dimensions. So uh, it was a new way to uh, to consider him mm -hmm. and to uh, and to know him. And this is exofiction, actually. But in uh, contemporary uh, French fiction, yes, of course, you have a lot of uh, social topics uh, being uh, being tackled, just like uh, feminism, mm -hmm. social inequalities. Uh, racism, war, uh, I don't know, what, yeah. violence, yeah, environment, um, you know, uh, uh, climate change, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's uh, it's a very uh, well, it it welcomes everything about society. Yeah, very diverse. Yeah, but there is a a big difference between any kind of fiction to me and literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to literature. You deal with art, so you deal with the form. You know, you don't only deal with the subject or with, with an issue right. or with the topic. You deal with uh, composition, uh, style, poetry, uh, rhythm. You know everything you usually find in literature, and what makes literature literature. So uh, uh, there is a big difference to me, and sometimes, unfortunately, this difference is being you know. Uh, forgotten and erased yes. and it's a very big problem too yes absolutely when you say that the form and style is different uh, between literature and what is writing uh, do you think the pandemic and the social media has brought about this change in the sense pandemic um, I feel writers will uh, have a different focus more on self and intimate relationships and uh, you know, and the style also will change, as well as um, the concentration span of today's uh, youth is very, very short. And so, do you think short fiction would be, or micro fiction would be, the order of the day? Well, the the answer is quite complex because, as for me, uh, I think that I usually live in a kind of lockdown. You know, because uh, <laughs> my work is very solitary. Uh, I mix with people but at night mm -hmm. and during the day I'm quite lonely uh, it's a good thing for writing so but this is not completely true I mean I can go outside if I want and during lockdown you, you couldn't so but there is a kind of perpetual uh, lockdown which is uh, uh, the condition to write but what has changed for me a lot is that during lockdown I was just like anybody. I was watching Netflix. I was on the internet for every kind of thing. So, since then, I I am still an addict, you know, of uh, Netflix, for example. And I hate it. I hate it because it it takes a lot of attention span. Yes. And uh, I was used to reading more, and I I read less because of this. So maybe well. And I'm a writer, so I imagine what it can have done on young people and uh, non-writing people. So it's, uh, it's a curse, I guess. <laughs> and I hope we will get out of, out it. of it. Right. So talking of that, uh, since you are dealing with uh, students, what is the reading percentage in France? And what do students generally read? And do they read? Okay, I do not have any percentage, honestly, I cannot say. I think that everybody reads. Uh, we've got this chance of having a very good educational system, though it's a bit problematic because we've got you know, money counts here, but, but it's very good. Everybody can read, learn to read. So it's, it's just for this, this is a, a very good situation. Um, but I deal with students, like students not your age at the back, it's uh, they are older, uh, they are between 22 and 70, <laughs> because they've got adults as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher at a university, so I, I can talk about them. Uh, and I think that indeed it's more and more complicated to find time to read for several reasons. The first one is certainly, as you mentioned, uh, okay, uh, there, there, is, there are distractions, okay, mobile phones, you've got to be in contact, perpetual contact. 
Another one is certainly education itself, because education has changed. But for example, well, I've got two kids, okay, age 16 and 13. And just like here, if I've heard well, you, they are asked to be also in contact with tablets and digital things. So maybe that's time consuming and they uh, have less time to read on paper. Then there is another problem, probably it's because students' life is maybe less easy than it used to be in the sense that they've got less time and maybe less money to spend uh, because books are expensive and they don't have so much time and so much money. But we are very lucky in France to have very good libraries. So we have, we, we have to consider, you know, French people, <laughs> they are, are complaining a lot. <laughs> They are known for this, you know, they're always complaining, grumpy, like. Uh, but they don't see uh, all the aspects of how lucky they are uh, when you're traveling around the world, you can realize this. So they are lucky to have those libraries and bookshelves as, uh, and bookstores as well. Very good bookstores. Yes. And the selection of books, which is incredible for anybody who has not been to, uh, to Europe, because in England also, in Ireland as well. But in France, it's really particular. Um, so that, that yeah. So, which is the genre they prefer? Because in India, mythology sells. What is what is there in France? Sorry. In India, mythology oh, books yes. are very very popular. Mytholo what do mythology, the youngsters? Yeah? Yes, mythology. Mythology. Uh, when you're talking about mythology, are you talking about Hindu mythology or Christian or Greek mythology? Well, mythology in all forms. In all forms. But well, what is it in France? Which genre? I think it depends really on the people. Uh, you see, we come from a very Christian-oriented education. So we knew a lot about Christianity when you went to a private school, for example, when you were kids. And at that time, from... This was my case, for example. I was in a private school, which was Catholic, so I received a, an education more related to religion. Okay. By the way, I turned to religions with an S, mm -hmm. because I thought it was far more understand, right. easy to understand the world. But I, I have nothing against religion or religions at all. On the contrary, mythology is different because there is Greek mythology, for those who are interested, it's really vast. For yes. example, I have my daughter, she's 16, she knows all the gods and goddesses, like it's, yes. uh, you know, she, my, my son is more on the Pikachu thing, like uh, he knows all the Pokemon's <laughs> names. Uh, so it's, this is his mythology. In fact, mythology, and I'm not dealing here with Hindu mythology, in fact, I'm quite interested in it. Uh, it's, it's your own mythology that you mm. create. And um, that's, that's life, by, th by the way. You need your imagination and you need some people in your pantheon, uh, your personal one. So mythology is always something that you do, consciously or not. But the common mythology would be more like uh, Greek mythology or Roman mythology, if I understand well. And then, as for the presence of Indian mythology or Hindu mythology in France, I think that we all know Ganesh, or Ganesha, or Anuman, maybe. And uh, we have all known the, the words, like the names of uh, Krishna, or Vishnu, or even Kali, or Durga. But that, that would be all. We don't know all the little stories, OK? OK. Uh, Natalie, I have a question for you. You have received so many prestigious prizes. Could you tell us about the prizes in France? Why are they so coveted? What are the different types? Yeah, we have a very strong tradition about prizes in France, literary prizes, uh, since the beginning, well, the end of the 19th century. Uh, the most prestigious one was uh, created by two brothers, mm -hmm. uh, two uh, writers of uh, the end of the 19th century called Les Frères Goncourt, Goncourt Brothers. Yes. Yes. And uh, so the prize, the Goncourt Prize is the most prestigious and uh, it's very important to get one because uh, you are, uh, uh, it's, it means that you're going to sell a lot of copies. 
Oh, well, whatever the quality of the book is. Well, usually <laughs> they choose good, well, quite good books. But it's, it assures you uh, a very big success. So uh, everybody wants it, and uh, all the publishers uh, struggle to have it, and are kind to the juries, and you know. So it's, it's normal for a publisher to convert it. And then you have the Femina Prize, uh, yes. to which I belong. Um, and it's quite also very prestigious. It has been founded by women, mm -hmm. and the jury is only uh, made women. of women, but we give the prize to men and As women. As well. Yeah, <laughs> both of them. <laughs> so, uh, in the same way, you sell a lot of copies if you, if you get the prize. Okay. And then you have the Medicis, yes. uh, which happens to be uh, more literary than the two previous ones, uh, because uh, the jury is made of writers, mm -hmm. which is not totally the case with the two uh, others. Uh, so it's a very literary prize. And, uh, and then you have many others like Interallier, Renaudot, mm -hmm. um, and all of them are given uh, uh, in November. Right. So uh, the race starts uh, the beginning of June, we receive as juries uh, all the novels Novels. that are going to be released uh, in September or at the end of August. Mm -hmm. And um, there are many. Well, for one single person to read, there are many because in my house I had 400 books, you know. Oh my God. So, uh, <laughs> in the whole. So, it was really a lot. And every year it's the same story. So, uh, we have to go through all these books during summer. So, of course, it's not possible to read all of them. But we make selections and we, uh, we have a lot of talks and a lot of emails going through so that we can, uh, you know, select more and more. And at the beginning of September, we have a first short list with about 15 books. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to uh, half of that, so eight books, for instance, by October. And then uh, by the end of October, the very big short list uh, is released and uh, we have far, uh, four or five books. And then uh, at the beginning of, of October, we, uh, we choose the, the book that okay. will be uh, uh, rewarded. So uh, it's a long process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite tiring because you have to read all these books. You have to... Uh, uh, talk about them with all the people. The publishers are, you know, on campaign. They yes. want to convince you that their book is the very best. And uh, so it's very disturbing. And as a writer, I'm very disturbed because I can see that it's so difficult to get a prize. And I had one, so I'm starting to rethink <laughs> about the way it happens. So how could they all agree on my book? And maybe there were a lot of fights and, you know, disagreements. And uh, finally, I got it. And it's so such a big luck. That shows so great. Yeah, because it changes all your life as yes. an author. Yes. Uh, you, well, you become, of course, a little bit more famous. And the journalists start to consider you differently. And you go uh, on tours through, uh, through, the, through France and abroad, just like I am here. So uh, it's a very big privilege. And um, it gives you a lot of courage, it gives you a lot of power, and uh, it encourages you to, to go on with writing, because sometimes writing can be very, very despairing, you know, yes, and absolutely. very depressing. Because <laughs> when you write books and nobody, want to want, nobody wants to publish them or to read them, it's very, very, very sad, sure. and you, that's why so many writers are depressed. And um, so uh, getting one of these prizes uh, means that you go through, well, it, it's just like a breakthrough, right. and uh, it's really, it's really it's important. It's very important, yeah. Yeah, it's a game-changing thing. Yes, absolutely. Mm. In fact, uh, this year the Nobel Prize uh, has been won by a woman, and and the French no. writer. Yes, yeah. the French writer, as well as the Goncourt Prize, right? Yeah, this year it was, you know, uh, all time women. for women. Yeah, all, all women. women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally women have got their acclaim in the world of literature. Sorry, Fabia. 
Oh, well, uh, I have another question regarding the prizes. Since I work at the Alliance Francaise here in Pune, uh, we have, we've heard about this Le Prix Goncourt des Lyciens, mm. something which is very, very typically uh, French, which is not in India. So could you just tell us about that? Yeah, the Prix Goncourt des Lyciens, you have the Femina des Lyciens too. Uh, these are prizes uh, that are chosen out of the second shortlist. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the different writers, the different novelists uh, are on tour in high schools mm -hmm. and they have to talk about their books to the pupils and to the students and out of all these tours and conversations uh, the pupils will choose the books, exactly. only the pupils. I think that's yeah. really fantastic. That really will encourage students to read. And they have a lot analyze. of power. Yes. Yeah, uh, they are encouraged to read because they yes. have to read the book right. and uh, the books. And they have to prepare questions to uh, ask the authors when they come to uh, their high school. And, um, and then they have a lot of power because these prices sell a lot. Right. So thanks to the pupils and the students. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. So we just have a last question before we pass it on to the audience. Um, uh, uh, Fabian, for pocket edition, right? It revolutionized the 20th century. Do you think that e-books will impact French literature today? Well, uh, quite surprisingly, in fact, I don't think so, uh, but I might be wrong. We need some distance to analyze this, it's like the pandemic. Uh, but so far, the French readers have uh, remained quite faithful to the paper version, and e-books or Kindle do not have the impact which was expected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which, uh, to me, is a good thing because we are always uh, we are already working on digital device and computers PCs all the time so that's like a, a relief to have something which you can feel and which is not electronic by the way i'm in a very digital town or city <laughs> but i have nothing <laughs> against digital things but it's good to have uh, this feeling touching the paper thing and uh, so i think this is an object uh, a precious object that we need to keep yeah. What it's do you feel? It, yeah, it's good for literature to be out of uh, the devices uh, field. So uh, and to remain a singular object, yeah, very uh, sensitive mm -hmm. uh, that you can uh, you can write on, that you can uh, browse, you know, in the way you want. And uh, well, as for me, I don't read on uh, computers, well, except all. for work and. Uh, papers and short stories but if i have to read a, a book i would choose to read in the well in, what, in the paperback edition yeah. or in the right. hardcover edition but Today's it's important generation. for me to have my book yes of my own it, yeah and it. to separate it from my device right. and from my computer absolutely right thank you so much may i throw the question and answer session to the audience uh, can you tell us what Annie Arnox wrote in her book? Oh, oh yeah, Annie Arnaud. So, uh, uh, Annie Arnaud uh, started to write in the 70s and she happened to be uh, from a very uh, uh, s low social background, you know, working class. And uh, she wrote all her books about this. I mean, uh, her main point is to tell about the background she comes from and the way she managed to get out of it and to become a literature uh, teacher, professor, and uh, to become a very free woman. She got married, then she divorced, then she went through a lot of... Uh, uh, love affairs and she wanted to write all about this and to be a witness of uh, the female um, evolution and conditions so her writing is what you call self-fiction it's all about her uh, all her books uh, are written with an I the first, pers pr first, first personal first pronoun person. yeah and um, 
and there are no novelistic ambitions. I mean, in terms of composition, well, there are because there are self fiction. So fiction, you know, just uh, uh, spreads everywhere if you if you let it go. But uh, what um, matters to her is to testify of a personal and social path, the the one she took. And uh, she's very uh, concerned with the social matters. And she's very committed, politically committed to. Right, so like you said, self-fiction. In fact, even uh, Brigitte Giro, who got the um, prize, Goncourt Prize, she has also talked about her personal life after the tragic uh, accident of her husband. So I think personal relationships and intimacy is more the uh, style of uh, contemporary literature today, right? Yeah, of course, because, uh, well, I don't want to be misunderstood, but in a way it's easier to write this way because you have to talk about yourself. Itself. And uh, this is why I was so, uh, I stressed the difference between art and fiction right. because uh, you can write, well, some self-fiction writers are very good. I remember that, for example, uh, Salman Rushdie uh, did a very good uh, self-fiction mm -hmm. book. But um, everyone is not Salman not Rushdie. Right. So uh, he's very talented and he's a very uh, uh, clever writer. But uh, as for the others, I wouldn't say that self-fiction is always art, you know. So you have to be very, very, very careful. careful with this. Yes. Bonjour à tout le monde. Um, I want to ask uh, literary movements come and go. So some time ago, like 40, 50 years ago in France, you had a movement in the writing of fiction which was called the New Novel, Le Nouveau Roman, which in many ways overturned the ways of writing. What you expected out of the reader, on the one hand, uh, the engagement the reader could have with the novel, on the other hand, and the overturning of tradition, traditional writing, like you have a plot, you have a narrative, you have ambience, you have character and so on. Has that remained or has that gone? I mean, I'm thinking of the couple of two, three novels I read earlier and I haven't read any current fiction in France. So when you had writers like Jura and Nathalie Sarut and so on, they had a certain way of writing. Does that persist or is it no more? Well, Nathalie, Nathalie Sarot is a very dear author for me, right. so in a way it hasn't gone, but in another way it has gone. So both, the, 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 the answer will be both. But uh, uh, the Nouveau Roman uh, questioned what you said about narrative and traditional characters and plots and things like that, and everything was uh, based on uh, telling a story with new uh, trends, with, new, with a new style, uh, being less subjective and more objective uh, and it was a kind of experimental research that uh, was very rich in a way and that enriched literature and for instance Nathalie Sarot who is for me the most important of them uh, and um, yeah very important uh, she uh, changed the way uh, the stream of consciousness can happen in the narrative. And she was very influenced by Virginia Woolf. Uh, so that Virginia Woolf is one of the iconic mothers of Nouveau Roman. Yes. And um, because uh, stream of consciousness uh, usually interrupted the narrative, the action of the plot, and the characters uh, would uh, express themselves in a very shifting way. You didn't know, you couldn't tell who was thinking this or that. And uh, But in Virginia Woolf, it was kind of, she, she, she was very cautious with her reader because she knew it was new. And so that she gives, she always gives hints to him and she said, she thought, he thought, so you're never really lost. Whereas in Natalie Sahot's fiction, sometimes you get lost because she could go further because you know the reader was already uh, used to it well a little bit more and as for me sometimes I go uh, further and further because I, I, 
I take it for granted that my reader is used to it, which is not completely true, because it's quite, you know, uh, confusing sometimes. But for instance, in one of my novels called Le Spectateur, I used to do this a lot. And some readers told me, but I didn't know who was talking at this time. Yeah, right. and so, you know, writers have to play. It's a playground too, so we have to try yeah. things and to go through experiences and through new, um, new style, stylistic forms, and uh, so that nouveau roman matters in this way. But if you s if you uh, take a current fiction today, it's it's less avant-garde. It's more traditional, you know, uh, current writers went back to plots and to traditional yeah. characters and to psychology and psychology was banned you know from nouveau roman but it yeah. had turned back so yeah. and i think the characters also in nouveau roman were always il and l and there was no real plot yeah because they didn't want to be bothered with, with characters names yeah with the name with the social conditions right. with uh, uh, physical features you know everything was banned but I guess you can't ban all these mm. things because you need them to uh, identify yourself, to relate to the characters. So you have to, uh, you make deals with your, with your reader and to give him, you know, and to give him at the same time information and freedom. Mm. Can I ask one question, Mr. Shafi? Yes. Is that uh, since you translate uh, from the literature of which country is most translated in France? Is it English literature or German or Italian or Spanish or some other? The, oh yeah, yeah. Today, well, that's that's. There is American literature, and there there are texts from American authors, <laughs> just as we mentioned before. That because you, we've got like very popular authors today. Uh, who are good authors, all right, and they sell millions of books. They are writing very well, and but I don't know if they will remain in the domain of literature, the one we are talking. Now, American literature also is very important. Um, I, I don't really know. I'm sorry. If to in terms of figures, I think there is a diversity there, which is really uh, you know even Russian literature, if we. Uh, Think about Dostoevsky, Chekhov. And, uh, you know, they've even if they are maybe less popular than they used to be. There have been other translations, by the way, like like Natalie, who's been translating Mrs. Dalloway again. Like for Dostoevsky, there have been new translations. So they adapt with the text adapts with the new society, which makes that the readers are perhaps uh, feeling that at temporality, which I was mentioning when I was in the case of Tagore. This is a bit lacking in the case of Tagore. So it's an invitation for myself, but many other authors and translators to be able to be translated in, um, in directly from the vernacular to, to the French text. But I'm sorry to say that I don't know exactly. I think American literature, English literature take a large panel of all this. So would someone like Rowling be uh, very popular in France? Like, sorry? J.K. Oh, oh, Rowling. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. She is in fr French. We have in a library books yes. on J.K. Oh, Rowling. Yes. Yes. You can find it hit. at the Alliance Francaise. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, but seriously, yes, she's so like. Uh, so <laughs> just as a corollary to what ma'am said, what is the presence of French literature in India? French literature in India, oh, this way, yes. uh, I would say that maybe we are not really conscious of, for example, the importance of someone like Maupassant, who was really the, the beginner of short stories, yes. and of course I'm influenced myself by Tagore, but you know that Tagore, for example, he had a brother and translated Maupassant directly from French to Bengali, and it went on like this. And the style, short story, is not that popular in France anymore. Oh. Definitely not, which I find quite surprising, in fact, because that would be really, uh, that would fit uh, reasonably well the, the need that we have to have maybe shorter text. But Maupassant, for example, has influenced writings like 
charulata that we mentioned ye yesterday at the Alliance Francaise because it's typically the kind of short stories that we would have had in France at a particular moment. Now, I I think that it's uh, the presence of France is diffused or conscious or unconscious because anything which it, it reminds me and maybe I'll stop with this it's when I was in St. Stephen's College uh, when I was teaching in St. Stephen's College daily I, uh, I had one lunch with two of my colleagues professors and they asked me they cracked a joke and they said what are two French people doing when they see each other for the first time <laughs> I said I have absolutely no idea <laughs> well the answer was they start three three political parties <laughs> which I find great because that shows how the, this, this is history of debate of polemics of uh, you know always trying to change things even if they are good I was mentioning the fact that they were complaining all the time but the complaining is construct constructive uh, criticism as well so this is this uh, diffuse thing that maybe we find again in India through authors who have also have accessed, uh, had access to, to, to this kind of literature and who have had this heritage in a, in a kind of way. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. But may I remind you, audience, that uh, there are two sessions by the authors today at 1, one o'clock in Hall 1 with uh, uh, Natalia Zulai. And uh, we have another one in the evening at 6 o'clock with uh, Fabien Chartier. So you are please welcome to go and uh, listen to the uh, um, presentation and also ask your questions. Thank you very much for your interaction and thank, thank you. you very much for a very informative. <laughs>